President Biden is expected to announce more economic action against Russia Friday, one year after the country illegally invaded Ukraine. The U.S. and its allies have already imposed multiple sanctions on Moscow. More than 9,000 individuals and more than 2,600 Russian entities or companies are under economic penalties. The U.S., the EU, and a number of Western countries are also restricting or completely banning Russian oil imports. While the long list of sanctions has hurt Russia's economy, it has not made the impact many had hoped for. Deputy Treasury Secretary Wally Adeyemo joins me now. He's the number two official at the Treasury Department, right under Secretary Janet Yellen. Welcome. I want to start with a, a conversation I had with Timothy Fry. He's a professor of post-Soviet politics at Columbia. And I want to play what he had to say about the success of sanctions on Russia. They have not caused the Russian economy to collapse uh, the way many have predicted. You know, Russia's a big uh, economy, you know, 145 million people, well-educated public, and, you know, they are pretty adept at finding ways to get substitutes from China or, or Turkey. I would just add one other that Bloomberg is reporting that 3.2 million barrels of oil a day are leaving uh, Russia. That's about where they were in 2022. So I gather you have a different view about where sanctions are affecting Russia. Where are they affecting the Russian economy and life in Russia? The truth is that at the beginning of this invasion, we have to look back to a year ago, President Putin predicted that he would take the capital of Ukraine within days and take the entire country within weeks. But today, because of the bravery of the Ukrainian people and the actions of the United States and our allies, Ukraine still stands as a democratic country and they're fighting off Russia's um, invasion because of the actions that we've taken when it comes to sanctions and export controls. The president laid out two goals for us. One was stopping Russia from being able to get the weapons that they need to fight the war in Ukraine. And the second one was going after Russia's revenues. Today, Russia has lost 9,000 pieces of equipment on the battlefield. Because of our export controls and sanctions, they're unable to build new tanks, unable to build new equipment to fight the war in Ukraine. And that's limiting their ability to get access to ammunition as well. In addition to those steps, you mentioned earlier that Russia continued to sell oil. And oil is the main way that Russia makes money. But recently, the United States and our allies and partners put in place a price cap on Russian oil, which has meant that Russia can't use G7 services to sell its oil for more than $60 a barrel. And what we've seen is that Russia oil revenues have fallen dramatically while they're still continuing to pump oil. So that last month, their, their oil revenues were down by 46%. So today, Russia is being forced to spend more money on their war of aggression in Ukraine while they're earning less money selling energy going forward. So what we're committed to doing is doing more over time to make it harder for Russia to continue to fight their war of aggression. Is it possible to give us a sense of when the, when the, the sand runs through the hourglass on this? If, if, if the Russians are not able to repair their weaponry and their economy is under strain and they're having to prop it up through all kinds of economic levers, is it possible to know when something will crack inside of Russia? Well, we're already seeing things crack inside of Russia, as we've seen the best educated, most talented Russians leaving the country in droves. You have to remember that the only reason that Russia's economy is standing today is because they put in place draconian export controls, which meant that anyone who wanted to try and get money out couldn't, and instead their money was trapped within Russia. What we're doing today is we're taking every action we can to make sure that we're slowing Russia down while our colleagues in our Defense Department are providing Ukrainians with the weapons they need to defend themselves and speed themselves up. Sanctions fundamentally are a tool, and they're a tool in service of our broader foreign policy goal, which is to make sure that Russia's invasion of Ukraine ends as quickly as possible. Is China helping Russia avoid sanctions? We know that China is considered Helping Russia, helping Russia avoid sanctions. And what we've made very clear to the Chinese and to every other government in the world and to companies and individuals is that if you provide material support to Russia, you're going to be held accountable, not just by the United States, but by our allies and partners. And we're going to be willing to use the tools, um, our various tools, to make sure that you're unable to do that going forward. I, you said, uh, picking up on this point, you said something recently, and I'm quoting you now back to yourself. We will force those that fail to implement our sanctions and export controls to choose between their economic ties with our coalition of countries representing more than half of the world's GDP or providing material support to Russia. 
So are you suggesting half the world's GDP is going to stop doing business with China if they provide material support to Russia? The reality is that these decisions are often made by companies and individuals within these countries. And these companies and individuals have to make a decision about what is in their business interest. Is it in their business interest to do business with Russia, a uh, relatively small economy and one that's getting smaller each day because of the actions that we're taking, or to continue to do business with the United States, the European Union, and countries that represent 50% of the world's economy? What we found to date is that for almost every company in the world, that choice has been a simple one. And for the companies that have chosen to do business with Russia, um, that continue to provide them with material support, what we're saying to them is that we're going to use sanctions and export controls to come after you going forward. But it's not a fait accompli. If China helps Russia, they're not gonna lose access to half. It's, your, it's just your hope that'll happen. And if it's your hope, can, can the US economy afford to do that? Can other economies afford to just lop off their relations with China, they're kind of intertwined, aren't they? My view is that ultimately China, companies within China, individuals in China are going to have to make decisions about where they want to do business. Ultimately, the economic relationship for all countries um, that are making choices here are more important with the countries that represent our coalition than they are with Russia. And fundamentally, what we've seen to date is that even where Russia has been able to find supplies from other countries, they haven't been, get, been able to get access to the highest quality semiconductors, for example, because those things are only produced by the countries in our coalition. So what's going on today because of that is, is Russia is unable to produce precision missiles, which can be used in Ukraine because they no longer have access to semiconductors that are needed. So ultimately, while Russia may seek to go to other countries, to other companies, to individuals, to try and find ways around our export controls and our, fi our financial sanctions, they're going to have difficulty doing so. And what we're committed to doing going forward is taking every step possible to make it harder for Russia to get access to the weapons they need to fight their war in Ukraine. Tiny question as we go out the door, um, the debt ceiling. There have been some assessments and analysis that once the Treasury Department gets revenues in from taxes this year, that maybe that uh, deadline that the Treasury Secretary uh, set might change, that it might actually get delayed into late summer or early fall. Can you give us an update on that? What I can say about the debt limit is that the United States has for our entire history paid our debts, not only to um, our creditors, but to the American people. We've made sure that Social Security has been paid, Medicare has been paid, that we've made payments to our troops. And we have to make sure that we continue to do that. Today, the US economy is the strongest economy in the world because of the policy choices we've made. We don't need a manufacturing crisis. That's why I know the president and um, the rest of the administration are calling on Congress to li lift the debt limit as quickly as possible. So the date's still early June. I don't have a new estimate to give you. What I, should, what I am saying is that we need to lift the debt limit as soon as possible. Deputy Treasury Secretary Wally Adeyemo, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me.